Good afternoon, NAF Nation. I'm Brenda Berry, and I'm NAF's Chief Program Officer. Today, we have the incredible honor of hearing from Jamie Cassip. As Chief Education Evangelist at Google, Jamie emphasizes the power and potential of technology and the web as enabling tools in pursuit of promoting inquiry-driven learning models. Jamie collaborates with school systems, educational organizations, and leaders focused on building innovation and iteration into our classrooms and educational policies and practices. He speaks on technology, education, innovation, and Generation Z at events all around the world. Jamie led Google's work to introduce Google Suite and Chromebooks into education. In addition to his role at Google, Jamie is an author and serves on a number of boards focused on education, innovation, and equity. Jamie teaches a 10th grade communications class at the Phoenix Coding Academy in Phoenix, Arizona, and he is an adjunct professor at Arizona State University, where he teaches classes on policy, innovation, and leadership. We're incredibly grateful to have worked with Jamie to develop this presentation, where he shares insights about changing education from a process to a mindset and preparing our young people for the future of work where all work is digitalized and focused on essential skills such as problem solving, lifelong learning, and collaboration. Please give a warm welcome to Jamie Cassip. Hi, my name is Jamie Cassop, and welcome to Flagstaff, Arizona. This is not my typical studio. I usually broadcast from my studio in Phoenix, but we're up here in Flagstaff, escaping the heat of Phoenix where it's 370 degrees. I am sorry that we can't do this in person. I can't be in a room full of people, which is my favorite thing to do, so we're gonna have to do it this way. Uh, I want to make sure that you see the slides that I will be using as well. So you'll see them posted up here. Um, so you'll see the slides that I'm talking about as I'm talking during this presentation. But those are the kinds of setups that we just have to discuss to make sure we're all on the same page. But anyway, my name is Jamie Cassop, and I am the Chief Education Evangelist at Google. I have been at Google now for 14 years, focused on education, technology and education, focused on how do we use tools to help level the playing field in education, to focus on equity issues. Um, I, this all started back in 2006 when we launched Google Apps for Education into the university space. And Arizona State University was the first university to use Google Apps. That's me and the, um, the CIO at Arizona State University where, where we launched uh, Google Apps. Then I had a couple of crazy ideas to launch Google Apps that we now call G Suite into the K-12 space. And then my craziest idea might be launching Chromebooks into education a couple years ago. And today we have 100 million students and teachers using our tools around the world, we have millions of Chromebooks in education, not even knowing that these tools would come in very handy during a global pandemic. Um, so that's kind of what I do at Google. I work across all the different teams that are doing things in the education space and make, to make sure that we're focused on building the right things. Now, I used to be able to travel around the world and these, these are my badges here. I used to travel around the world visiting education institutions, working with school systems, attending conferences, speaking at conferences, and of course that's not happy now. It's been a long time. I, I'm someone who traveled for the past 25 years, no matter what job I ended up in, and I haven't traveled in four months like most people, and this is the longest I've ever been in one place, and I am driving my wife crazy. But even not being able to travel, I'm still doing the same thing, which is I'm traveling around the world, visiting with schools and conferences, learning about what's happening, what the questions are, getting a sense for what some of the issues are in education, and they're very similar across the board. I helped start a school in Phoenix called the Phoenix Coding Academy. This is a school focused on computer science as a capability embedded into all subjects that students are learning. So it's computer science and history and computer science and art working across the board. 
Uh, this school has, we had our first graduation. I was gonna go speak at their first graduation because we just launched the school uh, four years ago. And unfortunately we couldn't have a graduation. So I spoke uh, just like I'm speaking to you via video. Uh, so most importantly, I, I am focused on education. Education seems to be the thing that I always come back to. And that's because I believe that education disrupts poverty. I believe education disrupts racism, education disrupts ignorance, education disrupts hate. Education is the core central thing that we all should focus on. And it's a personal mission for me. I am a first generation American, born and raised in Hell's Kitchen, New York. I was raised by a single mother on welfare and food stamps in the middle of New York City back in the 70s and 80s, the old Hell's Kitchen, when it wasn't a great place to be raised. It wasn't a great community. It was a terrible community and very bad things happen in that community. And I wanted nothing to do with that. So I decided to focus on what I thought would help me become successful. And that was education. Graduated high school, graduated college, gra graduated graduate school. And I've had a pretty amazing career, as you can see here, and life because of education. Everything from, you know, walking around the, the mountains of Uganda with gorillas and flying in an F-16 and actually flying it at one point and even speaking in front of the president and the first lady in the East Room of the White House. And I believe that education is the reason why I've been able to do these things. And my assumption is that I am not some super genius with a 300 IQ, even though that's what my wife thinks I think. I believe that there are millions of students just like me who need an opportunity, who have to have the access, who have to have the right conditions so that they can succeed just like I have. And that's what I think we can do through education. Now, what we need to think about is that the impact that we have on students isn't just with the students that we face in our career. We have to understand that the impact that we have on students is for generations and generations and generations. And I know this is true because now I have my kids and this is them. I have a 27 year old, a 19 year old and a five year old. Yeah, I thought I was smart having one kid at a time. And then for the last four months, they have all been living with me under the same roof. That's why we escaped up to Flagstaff. But my 27 year old is actually, or used to live in New York City until four months ago, working on film, doing video production, doing exactly what she was born to do and wanted to do her whole career. And she does it well. She works at CNN. She makes fake news. And she does it really well. She graduated from college four years ago now. I feel like it was two weeks ago, but she graduated from college four years ago and we never had a conversation about going to college. She just assumed she was going to college because I went to college and the people in her life went to college. She actually assumed that she was gonna to go to graduate school because I have a graduate degree and her mother has a graduate degree and she thought she was gonna do the same thing, but she assumed that I was paying for that and you know we took care of that problem. But my point is that college became just a normal thing for her. My 19 year old never had a discussion about whether he's gonna to go to school or not. He knew, just he knew that he needed beyond a high school graduation to be successful. He understood that. He understood that he needed that experience, not because I had to tell him, but because of the environment that he grew up in and the people around him. That's the value of education is that it goes on for generations and generations and generations. And I know they're gonna be okay and I know their kids' kids are gonna be okay. Now, if that's true, we should probably take education very seriously. And what we need to talk about is the state of education, even before the pandemic that we're dealing with now. Now, I'm not one of those education reformers that will stand here and tell you that education is broken or it doesn't work or nothing has changed in 150 years. That's not true. Education has dramatically changed in the last 150 years. Actually, education has changed in the last 20 years and has dramatically changed in the last four months. 
So we can't say that education hasn't changed. We can't say that it's broken. We built the superpower of a nation on the back of the education system that we built in this country. What we can say is just what our forefathers dealt with in education 150 years ago. We can say, are we prepared for the future? Is the current education model prepared for the future? And so our, our job is the same thing that our forefathers in education did, because they did an amazing job building an education system for the future that they faced. We need to do the same thing. We need to take the best ideas that we have in education and build the right model for the future that we face. That's the most important thing that we can focus on. It's not about transforming education. It's not about fixing education. It's not about changing education. It's about looking at it from a perspective of, is this the best system for the future that we face? What do we need to do to make it the best we can make it so our students can thrive in the future that our students face? That's the job that we need to do in education. And even this idea, this argument that technology is the way to go and that technology is the solution and technology is the savior, that's, that's not true either. We've had technology in education since the beginning. Motion pictures in the 1900s, television in the 1950s, and computers have been in education since the 60s. I remember I took a computer class 100 years ago when I was in ninth grade. I was told by a visionary teacher that computers were gonna be important in the future. I'd never seen a computer at that point. And she told me that computers were gonna be important. So I took a programming class and I learned how to program in basic. And some of the old people like me or who are watching this might remember this program because it was a national program. I learned how to program in basic and I wrote 5,000 lines of code to make a bird fly across the screen on a Commodore 64. Remember that? Yeah, for those of you who have no idea what we're referring to, it wasn't a bird. It was just literally a, a squiggly line that just went up and down on the screen. So computers in education is not a new idea. That argument doesn't work either. Here's the argument that does work and what we should focus on is that the world has dramatically changed since 1995 and has dramatically, dramatically changed in the last four months. Digitalization, technology, all these things have now wrapped around the core of everything that we do, and we don't even think about it anymore. For example, all of us use technology on a daily basis. We don't think about the fact that we're even using it. I asked that question of a live audience several months ago. I asked how many of you have not used technology today, and a woman in the front row, and there was like 6,000 people in a room, and a woman in the front row raised her hand, and it caught me by surprise because no one ever raises their hand. And so she's got her hand up here and then she's got her phone in her other hand. That's how much it's become part of our lives that you don't even know that you're dealing with technology. Digitalization has become core to everything that we do. And if that's true for us, the generation that was minding our own business when this thing called the internet showed up, where these things called computers and mobile phones showed up, what do you think that means for a generation of students who don't know what the world looked like before smartphones, before devices, before the internet, who don't know what the world looked like before Wi-Fi? This is the first true digital generation. They were born with technology. They don't know what the world looked like before technology. And there's two things I want to say about them. The first thing is that because of that, they think about the world in a different way. They think about learning, they think about research, they think about looking information up, they, they think about reading, they think about everything in a completely different way because of the world, the world they were born into. That part is true. The second part is that we've made a mistake. We've given this generation a pass. We tell them that they're digital natives. We say, oh, you were just born with technology. You just naturally know how to use it. And that's just not true. All the research shows us that they don't know how to use these tools. All the research shows us that elementary school kids can't tell you the difference between a sponsored website and a real news site. The research shows us that high school kids can't, pay, can't pick a fake story out of four stories. Four out of five kids, students couldn't do that. 
we've failed this generation into convincing them that they are just naturally gifted users of technology. And it's not true. So I'm hoping that we take this time to take a step back and do an assessment to really ask ourselves, have we really taught our students how to use these tools? Have we taught them to vet information, make sense of information? I had an adult teacher this morning in a webinar say to me, hey, when we're talking about vetting information and, and making sure information is credible, is it still true that you know websites that have a .com domain or .com ORG domain are more credible? The answer is no, because anyone can set up those domains. So we need to take our educators and teach them digital skills. We need to teach our students digital skills so that they can be prepared to do all the things that they're going to need to do in their educational careers and beyond. Because if you understand the future, if you understand what's happening, we are facing nothing but a digitalized economy. Again, I get to travel around the world, I get to talk to people and organizations from around the world, and this idea of digitalization is something that people are talking about everywhere. Digitalization is going to impact everything. And by digitalization, I mean everything that has to do with technology, computer science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, everything. Because we are no longer preparing students for jobs that look like this. These jobs do not exist for humans anymore. We're not even really preparing students for these kinds of jobs that look like this, where people would show up in an office and all do the same thing. We're not even showing up in offices anymore. We are now preparing our students for a digitalized economy where everything is around computer science and machine learning and AR and VR and automation, robotics and all those things. And what we need to understand is that the language to the new digitalization economy is computer science. Computer science is what drives all of this. Now, I'm not saying everyone needs to go become a computer scientist, but what I am saying is that everyone needs to understand computer science, understand digitalized principles, understand engineering principles, understand how design planning works, all the things that are around computer science, our students are going to need to understand at a deep level. They don't have to learn how to code or program. It would be great if they did, but they need to understand enough to realize that whatever solution they come up with, whatever, uh, whatever program, whatever platform, whatever product they come up with, it will have a digitalized element to it, whether they realize it or not. And the reason why they need to understand it is because they're not going to be able to come up with the best solutions unless they grasp that idea. Here's an example. I'm standing here in downtown Flagstaff. And if the, and lost the light. I'm standing here in downtown Flagstaff and I need to get to the airport. That's the problem that I'm trying to solve. But I don't know that cars exist. What kinds of solutions would I come up with? I would come up with a great solution about how I could walk to the airport, what time I would have to leave, how I could walk to be safe. I'd have all the mathematical formulas down. But if I don't know that cars exist, am I going to come up with the best solution? And that's the same thing with digitalization. Our students need to understand what it looks like, what it does, what they can do with it, because it's going to be part of any solution that they develop. And the reason why we need to do this is because everything that our students face is digitalization. They face nothing but a digitalized future. When you look at a picture like this, I should point to the right place. If you look at a picture like this, you see machines making machines. But what you don't realize if you're an old man like me or an old person like me is that you remember when humans used to do this work. That's no longer true. This is a generation of students who have no idea that humans used to do this kind of work. Now, those of us that have been watching these machines make machines, now we are looking at these machines getting up and walking around. What is this technology going to look like in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years? They are already doing things across the board. They can make walls, they can build things, they, they, can, they can look for and pack up our boxes and send them to us in our Amazon Prime accounts. 
You think that it's humans that are packing up those boxes? Some, a little bit, but most of that work of you going to Amazon, ordering something and having it shipped to you, the majority of that work is done by these little orange robots. And it's starting to have an impact in lots of different industries. 4.5 million people in this country make a living driving things, driving supplies, driving equipment, driving people, 4.5 million people. And you can buy a self-driving car today. Today, you can go to the store and buy a self-driving car. What is that technology gonna look like in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? I believe that because of what we're dealing with, we're going to see a rise of automation and robotics. Because think about the world from a business owner, from a CEO or COO, and think about what you've dealt with over the last four months. What you realize is that your biggest risk to your business is human resources. That your business shuts down if humans can't do the process work in an organization. And so what you're going to see is a more concentrated effort on making sure humans aren't doing that kind of critical work so that businesses don't shut down. And we can see that even in today's age. If you look at a picture like this, typical supermarket, and this is from the old world, uh, pre-pandemic, look, supermarkets look completely different. What are the workers in this supermarket doing? They're doing process work. They're taking your can, scanning them, and then putting them in a bag for you. And then they watch you use the keypad. This job has become so easy, we're calling it an essential job, and yet this job has become so easy that you can do it. And I know you can do it because this is the job that my five-year-old does in most stores that we go into. I just sit there and swipe through Instagram and she does all the work. I'm trying to teach her how to scan one thing but put two things in a bag, but she's just not that kind of hoodlum. What we need to do in education is think about not what's happening, but what's next. What's the next thing? Well. Companies like Amazon are asking, well, why do we need people at all? Why do people need to check anything out? Why can't you just check yourself in, get what you want, put them in a bag, and then just walk out of the store? And we're starting to see this. In the same sentence that we're calling supermarket workers essential workers, we're trying to replace them. And it's going to happen fast. It's already happening in Singapore and in South Korea. You're starting to see these essential workers be replaced by robotics and by self-service checkout stations and all these other things where these jobs are going to continue to move. Now, looking back at the supermarket example, does that mean that supermarket jobs are going away? Well, that's a tricky question. Yes and no process parts of supermarket jobs are going to be going away, but that doesn't mean supermarket jobs are going away. Because imagine I'm a business owner and I own a supermarket and, and I have one of these systems where you just check yourself in, take what you want, put it in your bag, and then you just walk out of the store. I don't need 20 people to do process work anymore. I don't need people to bag things because you're bagging yourself. I don't need people to sit there and watch you use a keypad and check things out because you're going to be doing that as you walk out of the store. Does that mean I'm not gonna hire people in my supermarket? No. What it means is that I'm gonna hire different people in my supermarket. I'm gonna hire different skills for my supermarket. Because if you think about supermarket shopping, you know, before the pandemic, it was just a terrible experience. You couldn't find anything, you're in there all day, you go to your favorite supermarket, not because it's your favorite supermarket, but because you know where everything is. It's a terrible experience. You're buying the same thing. You have the same grocery list that you've had for 20 years. You're buying the same stuff. Now, I'm the supermarket owner and I don't have to hire people to do process work. Now I can hire different workers. I can hire nutritionists. I can hire dietitians. I can hire cooks, food experts. So when you walk into my supermarket, you might be greeted by someone who says, what's your nutritional strategy this week? What diet plan are you on? Oh, you want to make lasagna, but you've never made it before. And when you blend those two things, it catches the kitchen on fire. Come over here, walk over to my demo station. I'll show you how to do that so that you don't burn the kitchen. I can hire higher skilled labor. I have to pay them more 
And I bet you that in my supermarket, I'm going to make a lot more money because I'll be upselling products and services to my customers. And this is true across all jobs. All jobs are being impacted by automation and robotics and will continue to be impacted. I just think it's going to happen faster now, given the pandemic and the lessons that we've learned through this process. This has been happening for a long time. The first time I showed up to work, there was an automation tool sitting on my desk. It was this device, this thing that did this magical thing called send an email. And if I wanted to send you a message 25 years ago, I would have to sit down at this terminal, type up my message, my letter to you, hit send, and seconds later, you would get it. Now, 35 years ago, if I wanted to do the same thing, I would have to write my letter out on a piece of paper and then hand it to what we used to call typing pool. People sitting with typewriters, I would hand it to the pool and somebody would take it and eventually they'd get it to the top of the pile, they'd take it, they'd type it up, they'd give it back to me. I'd make edits and do things to it and then we'd go back and forth for two weeks and then eventually we would just put it in an envelope and mail it to you. And this process that took two weeks is now done in a couple of seconds. Did that eliminate typing pools? Absolutely. But it, it didn't eliminate the need for employees in that firm that I was working at. They were just doing different work. And that's what's happening across all jobs. All jobs will be continuously impacted by robotics and automation. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, what it means is that we need to think about the skills that our students need given this glimpse into the future. Many organizations, including NAV, have put together a great comprehensive list of what those skills are, what those skills are that our students need. And this is the list that they came up with, and it's a very comprehensive list. I have a similar list. Mine's a little different. You can take all these concepts and put them into my list. But every time I see my daughter in the morning, this is the list that I think about. These are the skills that I want her to have. Problem solving, critical thinking, the ability to learn, creativity, and collaboration. Those are the things that I want her to know how to do, regardless of content, regardless of subject. I could care less what the subject matter is. As long as she's building these human skills that she's going to need in the future, I don't care what the subjects are. As a matter of fact, it would be ideal if she could drive the subjects. If she can, and we'll talk about that, but if she can drive the lesson, the learning, that's even better, as long as she's building these skills. If you want to trigger me, call these soft skills. They're not soft skills. They're critical, essential, number one priority. We've been talking about this list for so long, we call them 21st century skills. They're not. They're now skills. We're 20 years into the 21st century. And I think that when we say 21st century skills, it makes us feel like those are for the future. Skills that you need to build for the future. Don't worry about it right now, but in the future, you're gonna need to know how to do these things. No, we need them right now at five years old. And I wanna talk a couple of minutes about some of these. For example, the first one. We still ask our students a question that we need to stop asking them. We ask them, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? That question doesn't make sense anymore. That question was okay 100 years ago when I was in school, when jobs changed gradually, when things happened slowly. But we don't live in gradual times anymore because change happens gradually and then suddenly. And we now live in suddenly times. And what we need to understand is that the jobs of the future don't exist today. We need to understand that jobs are constantly shifting and changing. We need to understand that we can kind of create our own jobs and our own industries based on the things that we're passionate about. So that question doesn't make sense. The question that we should be asking students instead is what problem do you want to solve? What's the problem that spins in your head? doesn't have to be a social problem. It could be how to make better cameras, better lights, better microphones. It could be how to make cars go faster or make funky motorcycles, whatever it is. What's that problem that you want to solve? The second question we need to ask them is how do you want to solve that problem? That's an important question. 
How do you want to take your talents, your gifts, your experiences to solve that problem? And it's an important question because if a student comes to an adult or comes to an educator, comes to you and says, I want to solve climate change, let's just say that's the topic. You might be inclined to say, oh, climate change, you need to be a scientist, you need to be a researcher, you need to study STEM, you need to get a degree in sustainable development. Sure, there's lots of ways to solve the problem on that path. But what if that's not where their talents are? What if that's not where their gifts are? What if they are a talented photographer? They, since they're five years old, they've just been amazing photographers. They capture emotion, they tell stories through their photographs. And the way they can solve climate change is by going out and documenting climate change and showing what the evidence is of climate change and the impact that climate change has to convince people to focus on climate change. Maybe they're gifted writers and they can write about climate change. They can write about the impact that climate change has, has on communities and families. Maybe they're gifted educators. My 19 year old is going to be an educator. He just doesn't realize it yet. He's a gifted educator. The way he could solve climate change is by going out and creating documentation about climate change, a class about climate change, and an educational experience about climate change. My point is that there are millions of ways to solve a problem. How does the person's gifts, talents, and passions focus on that problem is what we need to get our students to think about. And then the last question we need to ask them is, what do you need to know to solve that problem? What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities you need to have to solve that problem? And in this case, in two areas in climate change and photography. How do you continuously learn? What classes can you take? What information is out there? What research? What books? Who's solving this problem now? How can you connect with them? You don't think that there are environmental photographers out there that work for Nat Geo or other organizations around climate change? What do they know? Who do they know? How do they learn the things that they learn? Where did they start? What do you need to know to solve that problem? is an important question. And that's where we come in through education, where we can say, we're here to help guide you, curate information for you, point you to expertise so that you can solve that problem that you're passionate about. So that's the first one, problem solving. But if you would have asked me five months ago, six months ago, hey, Jamie, look at this list of critical skills that you mentioned. Is there one more important than the other? I would have said no. They're all equally important. They all need to be worked on at the same time. But now I look at that list and I've changed my mind a little bit. I believe that there is a priority to these skills. And the one that we need to work on right off the bat, right from the beginning, all through school, is the ability to learn. To me, that's the most critical one. Everything else is found, everything else is based on that concept, that idea of the ability to learn especially given what we've experienced over the past four months where students went from the space where they were being told what to do and how to do it and how long to do it and how long they would study something and read something and what they would do in schedules and calendars. They went from that to all of a sudden being on their own and having to learn. And lots of them fell apart because we never really focused on the ability to learn. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying the ability to take a test or the ability to outline a textbook or the ability to listen in class. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to learn around self-awareness. This idea that you know you don't know something. I don't know how to do something. And then where do you go learn how to do it? And then how do I know I am doing it now well? this self-awareness component. I talk to lots of adults who tell me things like, I'm not very creative, or I'm not good at math, or I'm not good at financing. And I say back to them, and this is why I don't have a lot of friends, I say back, no, you've chosen not to be good at math. You've chosen not to be good at being creative. These are choices that you've made because everything that you need to be creative, everything that you need to work on your math skills, 
Everything that you need to be better at finance is there for you. It's out there. You have the world at your fingertips. So it changes the language. It changes the conversation from I'm not good at math to I need to learn how to do math better or I need to learn this concept of math. Where can I go learn how to do it? I launched a YouTube channel a year ago and I knew nothing about videography, knew nothing about editing video. I've always been a photographer my whole life. That's one of my passions and hobbies. And I didn't even know my camera had a record button on it. You know, the only films I've ever done were like little clips on my phone. I went to my daughter, again, who works in videography, has a degree in film. And I said, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. Where do I need to know? Where do I start? Because I know nothing. And after she's finished laughing for 10 minutes about me starting a YouTube channel, she said, okay, shoot at uh, 24 frames per second. Make sure you're doubling your shutter speed. You don't need to shoot at 4K. 1080 is fine. Make sure you keep your ISO at 100 so that you can keep the grain levels down. And if you go outside, that's going to blow out your exposure. So you want to use a variable ND filter to, the, to manage the light. And I said, cool, thank you, thank you, that's very helpful. Here's my second question. What the hell do any of those things mean? I knew zero. And today, a year later, I can have the best debates about what's the right light, what's the right camera you should use, what's the right lighting situation that you set up for a video. I can have arguments around whether 10-bit is better than 12-bit in-body versus external recorders. I can have all these discussions and arguments because I've taught myself. And I know I'm getting better at it because I can see if you watch my YouTube channel and all of you should go subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you watch my YouTube, <clears throat> if you watch the videos on my YouTube channel, those first couple of videos look like hostage videos. And now you look at the last couple of them and they seem to be a lot better and I can see the progression. That's the most important thing that we can help our students with right now is the ability to learn because we think about education as a process. Education is something that happens to you. You are educated. You go through education. You are an educator. You graduate from eighth grade and high school and college. We turn education into a process. And what we need to do is turn it back into a mindset. Education is a mindset. Education is constant and consistent. You are never done learning. And our students need to understand that upfront that just graduating from something or just finishing a test or just finishing a chapter, that's not done. That's just a milestone. And we need to help sure, we have to make sure our students understand that. And the other one that's just as critical based on those other two is collaboration. We talk about collaboration in education, but we don't mean it. Education is still set up as a single player sport. You're responsible for your grades, your assignments, your tests. The problem is that we live in a team-based world. And that's how problems get solved, through a team. Imagine you're a ninth grade teacher and you give out a test in your class. And at the end of the test, two students from the back of the class come up to you. And they say, we were sitting back there and I realized that there were a lot of answers that I knew. But then I looked over at her paper and there were a lot of answers that she knew that I didn't know. So we decided to combine our test and do it together. So here you go. What would your reaction be? Why is finding people who are smarter than you cheating? Why is collaborating cheating when that's all I do for a living? Even today with remote learning, I see tons and tons of like, make sure your students aren't cheating when they take a test online. Here's a way to watch them. And like, that's not how life works. You want to find people who are smarter than you. You want real collaboration to happen. The ability to change your mind, the ability to listen, the ability to ask good questions. One of the things Google looks for when they hire people is called leadership. And do you think by leadership we mean, can you tell people what to do and they just follow you blindly? No, we're really asking, can you collaborate? Can you lead? Can you take a step back and let someone else lead? Can you build consensus? Can you motivate? Can you influence? Can you inspire? That's collaboration. So how do we make sure we're focused on real collaboration, especially given the world that we're in now, 
when everyone is remote, I believe that collaboration becomes even more important in this kind of environment. And so what I think we need to do is look at education, not as something to blow up or start over, but look at education and ask ourselves, how do we take this model that served us well for a very long time? How do we take this model and take the best ideas that we've developed over 150 years and now that we know a little bit about the future and all the great ideas and all the great research that we have about what good learning looks like, how do we take that and bring education to the next level so it looks more like this, where students are making things and building things and collaborating, where teachers are there to guide and coach. They're not there to tell them whether they're right or wrong, but they're there to give them the, the tools that they need so that they can decide if they're right or wrong, where they can lead where they can use what they know to drive their learning. They can use their curiosity to drive their learning. We need that. And we don't need to blow everything up. What we need to do is understand that there is no future classroom. That the future classroom starts on Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday. And what we really need is iteration and innovation that we're constantly as leaders sitting on and asking ourselves what's working, what's not working, how do we improve it, what does that look like, how do we measure it? And then we take that mindset on that we're not trying to build something for 20 years out when the world's changing too fast, but instead that we have this culture. It's a culture shift. It has nothing to do with tools has nothing to do with technology because if all we do is take technology and put it on top of our current model then all we're doing is making the old model different or maybe a little bit faster and that's what i've seen happen in the last four months i've seen school systems take their current model and try to bring that online to do exactly what they were doing but except now they're doing it online and it's been a disaster the school systems that were focused on inquiry, the school systems that were focused on self-directed learning, nothing really changed too much during the pandemic. I mean, there were equity issues and obviously we need to address those equity issues and access issues, but most of the students in those types of programs were like, okay, now my meetings with my other students happen online, not in a hallway. And I'm still driving my own learning, so nothing there really changed too much. And if I have questions or if I need guidance from my teacher, I can ping her on chat, and so they're, they're, they're right there. So nothing changed for them. Who it changed for dramatically were the school systems that were using old models of education. And the same is true for work when it comes to internships. I know you guys deal with a lot of internships, and I've had lots of students reach out to me and say, oh my goodness, I've lost my internship. Uh, my company cut the company I was going to do an internship cut it off and for some reason all these internships disappeared and I don't understand why I think we need to understand what is the purpose of an internship and the first purpose of an internship is to provide students a real life experience of the working world this is the real life world there just because you can't bring them into an office and do something doesn't mean you shut off your internship program. It means that this is the world, that you have to adapt to it. And that you can still have students working remotely as interns because the things that they can learn don't change. They can learn how to collaborate, work well together. They can understand how industries work. They can understand the lingo. They can see what teamwork looks like, doing time management, project management. They can get feedback on deliverables they create. <clears throat> They can continue to build their networks and their relationships. All those things that an internship brings value to is still there. It's just done in a different way. So I'm encouraging organizations to step back and say, what does an internship look like in this world? How do we meet the priorities or the objectives of what an internship is supposed to do? And how do we do that with the new reality? And here's the good news. We are just getting started. I'm a glass half full kind of guy, and this is the beginning of the next phase of education. We're just at the very beginning of this. The internet started 25 years ago. In 1994, only 1% of the world was online. Please tell me that 1994 was not that long ago. Today, that number is only 50%. 50% of the world is online. We're not even halfway there, because some of those countries that say they have internet access, they don't really have internet access. So we're at the beginning of this. The second lesson is that we've been here before with another technology called electricity. 
Thomas Edison had his plant up and running in the late 1800s and he was trying to convince business leaders to adapt to his new technology called electricity. And he had a terrible time doing it. He could not convince people to switch from steam engines to electricity. He spent a long time trying to convince these businesses and he was only able to convince like 4% of the businesses to switch to electricity. And 10 years later, those companies were not getting good results. So you had a situation where you had business leaders back then saying, see, electricity is a fad. It's not here to stay. I'm sticking to my steam engine. And that solidified for almost 50 years. It took 50 years for electricity to catch on. And that's where we are today. An understanding that it's not about taking technology and putting it on top of the current model because that's what they were doing with electricity. They didn't change anything. It wasn't until those businesses changed their models where they could take advantage of electricity that they saw the dramatic changes and benefits. So if all we do is take technology just like they did and put it on top of our current model, we're not gonna get better results. We're just not. Or we might get marginal improvements. What we need to do is ask ourselves, what are the best ideas that we have about learning? What are the best ideas that we have about internships? What are the best ideas that we have about running businesses? And then how do we use technology to bring those ideas to life? And that's what we need to focus on. I wanna thank everyone for listening. I know it's not the same thing as it is to be in person. No one wants to be on the stage right now more than I do. This is hard. I usually play off crowd, so I'm hoping that this was engaging enough for you guys. Here's my contact information. Uh, you can follow me on, on you can follow me on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. You can reach out. My message button on Twitter is available. I have my YouTube channel where I provide career advice, lessons learned, a whole bunch of different things. I just posted a commencement speech that I did on YouTube. All that information is up there. Please reach out, let me know how I can help and how I can work with you guys. And I appreciate your time. I want to thank NAF for having me here today. Please stay safe, please stay healthy, and I will see you guys the next time. Hi, this is Jamie Cassip live coming to you from my studio here in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 350 degrees. Uh, so you just watched the video that I that was posted that I did a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm, I was actually going through the Twitter feed, seeing what people were saying. So I had some responses to that. But I want to get to the questions that you guys have here in the chat. So let's start off. I don't like looking at questions before I answer them because then you're mentally prepping for questions that you might not want to answer. <laughs> All right, question number one, what do we need to, to do to be in the know of the latest technology that we should be teaching our kids? Uh, that's a great question. And, and this is what I'll say about the, what, what, what we being in the know. And that is that I'm gonna be on this kick where I want us to stop talking about technology. Stop talking about the latest and greatest technology. I'm actually in the middle of putting together a presentation around this idea that what we need to do is start using the technology that we do have until we master it, until we, until we get the best we can out of that technology before we start looking at even new technology. That way we can get into understanding what the technology is all about and what it does for us. So for example, I'm a photographer, right? If you go to my Instagram account, you'll see uh, all the photos that I take. And my photography gets better, not because I keep buying better and better equipment or the latest technology, it gets better because I'm using the technology. And that's what I want us to think about when it comes to using technology in education is let's master what we currently have. So that's part of it. The other part of it is let's try to understand the why behind the technology. So I would ask the audience a simple question to think about. What's the difference between Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, right? Three social media platforms, what's the difference between them? And the reason I ask is because if you can understand 
the why, why something exists, then we can start talking about how to take advantage of it or how to use it. So I'll give you a simple example. When it comes to Facebook, a young person looks at Facebook as the place that the family lives and hangs out. And that's where you, you, you post your best pictures. Instagram is again, a place that you communicate through pictures. Snapchat is something that's happening now and TikTok is something that you do quickly, but have thought and process put into it, right? And so if we think about these different technologies and how students use our technology, we, if we understand the why, then we can dive deeper into understanding what we can do with it. So that's what I would say about that question. <clears throat> question number two, how do you add back the human element? Researchers are trying to teach AI how to be more human-like. Siri will answer you with a mm, question. Okay, so that's an interesting question. A couple of things about that. Number one is one of the terms that I kind of giggle at all the time is this idea of artificial intelligence <laughs> because it's nowhere near that. If, if you think about machine learning or artificial intelligence and put it up against the human brain, we're not even remotely close to being human. Like we are one one hundred thousandth of the capacity that we can do with AI compared to what a human brain can do, right? We're not, maybe one day we'll get to the point where the, the AI engine will be exactly like a human brain. I, I don't see that happening. And if, and if it does happen, I don't even wanna know what happens if the AI gets better, right? We're, this is, you know, we're talking about uh, Terminator stuff here. So we're nowhere near what the human brain is capable of. What we need to understand about the technology and the, is that it is about human. It, it's about not one comparing to the other, but the integration of both, right? Technology integrating with human behavior together. That's why it's important to focus on the critical skills that our students need. Think of it this way. If we're giving our students tests on things, on answers that machines can figure out better or faster, then we're, we're wasting our time. What we need to do is focus on the human stuff. And the reason why, why we don't, and the reason why it's human, it's because it's hard to measure, right? Problem solving, I talked about it in the video, problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, the ability to learn creativity. Those are the human elements. How, how do we master those skills and how do we know students are getting better at them? That's one of the difficult things that we find. It's easy to, to measure you know, a test to give someone a question, give them four multiple choice answers and they give you an answer back. That's easy, but a machine can do that. What's harder to measure is creativity or problem solving skills, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. How do we measure those skills so that people can see how they're progressing across that? So it's a combination of both, right? So the, the, the whole idea is that it's not one versus the other, it's the combination, right? So for example, for those of you we don't go anywhere anymore, but for those of you who get into a car and drive to work, you're using technology, you're using a human being with the technology mashed up together to accomplish a task. And, th and that's been true forever, right? The first time I sat at my desk 25 years ago, there was an automation tool sitting on my desk called the email. That kind of combination has been happening for a long time. You can, you know, farming is, is it doesn't matter what industry, there's a combination of machine and human and the, and the goal isn't to replace humans the goal is for those machines to replace the parts of human behavior that aren't human like repetition is not a human thing right taking a piece of paper and putting it here uh, for eight hours a day is not a human behavior this is the human behavior so how do we maximize those skills and how do we make sure we're teaching those skills so that we don't have to worry about the machines that the machines do their thing and they do it well and we do our thing and we do it well all right, question, uh, follow up to question two. Oh, there's a follow up. I think this pandemic has taken us to this realm of where technology is going to replace simple tasks. Absolutely. And again, this is something that's been happening for a long time. And I wouldn't even say simple tasks because I would say they could be complex. I would say repetitive tasks. Things that, you know, if you think about AI again or machine learning, there has to be a predictable answer or it doesn't work. And so it's not necessarily about simple tasks, it's about repetitive tasks. You know, taking a mathematical calculation that takes 10,000 years 
and boiling that down into 300 seconds is not a, it's not a simple thing, but it's a repetitive thing that can easily be figured out. So I would say that it's more about the repetition than it is about the simple task. And again, we do this in our daily lives, right? No one, you go to the, think about it, you know, you go and use your vacuum cleaner. That's a technology. You put on lights. That's a technology. It's this combination, this blend. Okay. Question number three, what problem do you want to solve and how do you want to solve the problem? Replacing what do you want to be in your growth? I, so I talked about that in a video. I don't know if you're asking me, but I, I don't, the problem that I'm trying to solve is pretty simple. It's to determine which one of my assumptions is correct. Assumption number one is that I've had success in my career and I've had a pretty interesting life and I got a great education and, and I got an education in general, all those things. And, and I do what I do and I'm in this influencing and in, you know, uh, influencing position here. And I did this because I am a super genius and I have an 800 IQ. And that's what my wife thinks I think. Or the other assumption is that there are millions of students who are just like me, who, have the, who are dealing with the same experiences. But for some reason, as I get older and I get more in my career and progression, I don't see people like me. That means that they're not getting, coming up to that level. What the problem I'm trying to solve is a recognition and understanding that there are millions of students who are growing up the way I grew up and that they have not only power and potential and capability and capacity, they also have unbelievable talent that we're not utilizing. And I wanna tap into that talent. And so for me, that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. And that problem of getting more Jamie's, if you will, into the system, into positions of power and influence is that we need to eliminate luck as the most important requirement to success. Everyone has luck, but for those of us who are growing up like this, luck seems to be the one factor that if you don't get, you just don't succeed. And we can, we can do better than that. And so what I'm trying to do is eliminate luck as the requirement to success, but more importantly, understand that there's talent out there and then go tap that talent. And that could be through K-12, that could be through higher education, that could be in the business world, that could be through uh, um, nonprofits. There's lots of ways, again, that I've said this before, to solve that problem. I'm trying to solve it right now through K-12 and higher ed, because I think education has the most potential and is the most powerful, especially given where we are today. All right, let me see here. Question number four. What's your favorite platform for student collaboration? What's a good tool for high school students to use online out of school hours so they can ask each other questions and help each other out? So again, it's identifying how our students already communicate and taking advantage of that. So for example, obviously I use Google Docs. I just actually send someone a doc that, so that they can make edits on something. Google Docs is a great tool and others are coming close, right? Microsoft has its thing. So Docs gives me an opportunity to see in real time what people are doing so I can collaborate with people. So that's just, that's just a no brainer to be able to use Google Docs. Now, when it comes to other forms of communication, what we need to do is don't try to impose our will on our students. For example, if I sent my 19 year old an email right now, and I said, if you respond to this email, I will, I will give you $10,000, you know, five days would go by and be like, oh, I missed the window. But if I text them right now, 10 seconds later, I get a text back. That's how he communicates. And so identifying how our students communicate and taking advantage of that. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should have everyone's text uh, uh, phone numbers, there's, but there's ways of doing it. There's lots of programs out there where you can create phone numbers and use applications so people can collaborate. Teenagers communicate through text and pictures and that we should be able to use that. But we also not, not limit the way they present information back to us, right? For those of, for those of you who, have no idea what TikTok is about. And like you, you go through it and you're like, I don't, I don't get this. I don't understand it. I, I'm too old. Any of those people that go through that, I need you to take a step back, take a deep breath and look deeper. Because when you're looking at TikTok, what you're looking at is communication. You're looking at storytelling. You're looking at creativity. So when a student says to you, okay, I did all this research. I put this paper together and I want to present it to you through a TikTok video. 
There's nothing wrong with that. That's how they communicate. So identifying how they communicate and how they process things is important. And let's take advantage of what they already know how to do. And I think that's it. Okay, did I get them all? I think I got them all. Oh, all right. So, so to wrap up, I, I know there's some a lot of comments around this whole idea of, of problem solving and what we want, what problem we want to solve. I think that's the most important question we can ask our students instead of what do you want to be when you grow up. What's this is a problem solving generation. This is a generation that wants to solve problems. So let's give them the tools that they need to solve that problems. Let's give that to solve that problem, and then let's identify how they can solve that problem. I think the best thing that we can do for our students is have them give them the tools so that they can identify their passions, so that they can identify what they're talented at, so, so they can try different things like writing and, and creating videos and music and stagecraft, whatever it is, so that they can express themselves to find the best way for them to communicate how they want to solve the problem that they're passionate about. Thank you, guys. Hey, you can reach out to me on Twitter if you have any other questions. Jamie, thank you for a compelling and inspiring look at the future of education, work, and most importantly, the capabilities of our young people. NAF Nation, in response to the uncertain learning environment that we're experiencing right now, we have taken action on many of the ideas that Jamie shared with you, and we are committed to ensuring that our students are ready for the future now. Over the past couple of months, We've put a lot of energy into building resources that are focused on the digitized world of the future so that you can experience and implement virtual classrooms, remote internships, and work-based learning. Jamie mentioned critical and essential skills that students need now and into the future, regardless of academic discipline or academy theme. NAF's educational design has always focused on developing essential college and career-ready skills and work-based learning experiences and our college and career readiness index help develop these skills. Jamie also discussed the need for internships in person or remote to help students understand how industries work, the lingo, time and project management, to get feedback on deliverables that they create, and to network and build relationships. At NAF, we're supporting and delivering remote work-based learning, including internships, by creating a whole host of new resources, by presenting webinars with tools that will help your teams implement these experiences. And with support from our corporate partners like KPMG, Verizon, and Capital One, we're so fortunate to continue to deliver Future Ready Labs this summer. And the good news is that these resources are now available on NAF.org. Just click on the orange banner at the top to find resources which include NAF curriculum, work-based learning and internship resources, as well as the lessons from our college and career readiness index. As Jamie says, this is just the beginning. The NAF team is here to help support you as you break through some of the most significant challenges that we have faced. As you prepare students for the next phase of education, and as you create a more inclusive and engaging learning environment. We want you to know that we're here for you and that we believe your students are incredible and our future is bright.